Alright. One more time. One more time. Then you go back in your room. There are over 7 million mentally ill and emotionally disturbed children in America. This program is about some of those children and the institutions they live in. Children of Darkness, next on Nonfiction Television. This program is made possible by a grant from the Independent Documentary Fund, which is supported by the National Endowment for the Arts, the Ford Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and public television stations, with additional funding from the following. His name is Brian. Along with 16 other mentally ill children, he's on a bus trip to the zoo. Brian believes that somebody is following him. A truck. The truck's following us. A truck's following us. A truck's following. A truck's following us. That guy back there is driving me crazy. Oh, God. Oh, oh God. They right dropped in. Oh, God. Oh, don't wait. You better stop that truck. Don't wait. You better stop that truck. I'm going to fly! He's going to kill my motherfucking dog with my dad. I'm going to kill you! Brian suffers from mania and schizophrenia. He's been this way since he was four years old. Brian lives here, at Eastern State School and Hospital in Trevos, Pennsylvania. 160 children live with him. They're psychotic, schizophrenic. They suffer from organic brain damage and autism. Some are hyperactive, some totally withdrawn. Some are suicidal. Jerry's parents are alive, but because of his muscular dystrophy and emotional problems, they didn't want him. My parents were ashamed to go out because of me. They were ashamed to take me out, you know. It's like, it's like I was the best sheep of the family. It's like tomorrow's his two year anniversary. And his parents just more or less dropped him off here and said, you got him, see you later, and took off. When my mom brought me here, I seen her, and I ain't seen her since that day. Since that day she brought me in here, I have not seen her. And three days after, they took off from Las Vegas and just left him, left me here. And I didn't know for six months because I was trying to call him at home, and I got somebody else moved into our house. And six months later, they wrote me a letter saying they were out in Las Vegas. And they enclosed it with a check for $20. And I guess it's about time that I say something to the fact that they don't want me no more, and they never will, and that. It's time for me to get out of here and make a life for myself, which I plan to do when I leave. Can you do it? Yes, I think I can. I think I can. Many of the children at Eastern are chronically mentally ill. They'll never see what we see, hear what we hear, think in ways we do. How much lived you got in there, son? Brian McAnally has lived at the hospital for the last four years. Oh, it's me. I want to go swim. That's what I want. Oh, wait. 
Yeah. Praise the Lord, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Everybody's right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Lord. Praise the Lord. I want you to lay down, please. Right. Come on, I want you to lay down, okay? Don't get me sweat. I'm not going to get you sweaty. I just want you to lay down. Lay down, Mark, because I think you need to relax. Okay. Because you're a little bit upset, okay? Okay. All right, I'll be outside the door if you need me, okay? It's a dentist's office. It's a dentist's office. Uh, hi, doctor. Do you know what's going on with him? What's the matter with him? You know what's going on? Not really. It's... Brian is... It's kind of scary. It's falling down. Brian's a very psychotic young man, and Mark, so like I said, he was doing really, really well until about a month or so ago, and he started just regressing, going completely the opposite way. He's, it's like he's coming unglued, and he's hallucinating a lot more. Uh, he really has no sense of what reality really is. Uh, the other night, he was in his room crying, and I knocked on his door to open up. Said, "Brian, what are you crying about?" He said, I got hit in the head. And I said, you got, I hit, got in hit, head. hit in the head? Who hit you? I got hit in the head. He said, I was looking out the sun. window and the sun hit me sun in the head. And he was like really upset all night about, you know, looking out the window, getting hit in the head with the sun. He's okay. having a really rough time. Okay. Tomorrow night we have a van ride. Mm -hmm. All right? Well, and if, if you're good and if you feel better, maybe we'll take you out on the van ride. Okay. All right? You're going to stay I back with me, Brian. You're not going to go to the kitchen. Oh, you no! Don't, you don't have any money, Brian. Brian? Things, okay, Doc. That's all right. All right. That's good. Oh, Doc, that feels Very good. good. Oh, Very I feel good, good now. Oh, okay, I can dance. Why don't you stay in here for a few okay. minutes, okay? Thank you, Mr. Don. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Sit down. I'll call you 10. Okay? I'll be back in a couple okay. minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Don. It's, it's perfect. I, yeah. What the hell does it all mean? I mean, you're here tackling kids, holding them to bed, sticking needles in them. Is that is that uh, psychotherapy? What's going on? It's the best we got. I'm serious. It's it's the best that we have. I mean, there are other institutions that, you know, may be a little bit better. There may be a little bit more staff, but I've worked in enough institutions to know that this is, you know, it's the best system we got, and nobody's come up with a better system yet. Is everything that's going on upsetting you, Brian? Yeah, uh, the walls are yeah. cracking. The walls are cracking. Oh my God, look. Raphael, walk with the group, please. Eastern State is the largest children's state psychiatric hospital in America. This year's budget is for $13.5 million. That's $84,000 per year per child. For this, each one gets food, medication, and a place to sleep. For those who could benefit from it, there is almost no one-to-one -one or any other form of psychotherapy. The major therapy at Eastern is drugs. Almost every child there gets some form of psychotropic medication. I like to go swimming. Medication that alters the brain's chemistry in an attempt to control psychotic behavior. Olivia Lakes. Olivia Lakes. He's a likable boy. He is mildly retarded. I'm not retarded. I'm retarded, right? In the sense of the word. Um, retarded. 
damage due to uh, environmental conditions at home. Uh, Brian was a, was a product, I think, of an unplanned pregnancy. He was abandoned by his mother. He's never, never seen her. Father is very much involved, very loving, He's coming very to concerned today, right? as to what his future will be. Brian! All right, Brian. I look forward to every Sunday for Brian. It's my day. Sunday is my day. Sunday's the day Jim McAnally and his son have spent together for the past four years. It's the day Brian gets to go home. Most Sundays, Linda Nixon comes along too. She grew up next door to Brian, and he likes to think of her as his girlfriend. Mr. McAnally lost his leg in an automobile accident when he was 19. Now he's 70 years old and has had two serious strokes. When Brian's illness became too much for him to handle, Jim had to give him up to the hospital. But for the first 14 years of Brian's life, Jim raised him in this house in East Philadelphia. During the Depression, Jim earned a living selling bananas, oranges, and strawberries from a horse-drawn wagon. On the streets of Philadelphia, they called him the Huckster. Brian, sit down a minute. All right, come on. I'm going to do the Huckster for you. Okay. All sound, solid tomatoes, new white potatoes, hard heads, a lettuce, fresh cabbage, string beans, bananas, three pounds for a quarter. Be right there, lady. Yeah. <laughs> Remember Fritz ate your leg off? Yeah, I remember that too. Sure, Fritz, so how Fritz ate your leg off? No, I was laying on the couch taking a nap. Yeah. <laughs> what's going to happen to Brian when I die? I don't know what's going to happen. Who's going to go take Brian out on Sunday or a Saturday? Who's going to bring him home for the holidays and show him the love and care that I show him? Maybe that's one of the reasons I shower him with affection now to try to give him everything that I possibly can now, knowing that when I'm gone, he won't get it. Yeah. Brian is uh, taken care of financially. He won't want, but he will want love and affection. He will want love and affection. Where is he going to get it? Where is he going to get it? It was like a parade. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with Brian in my eyes. Hi, Grandpa. Nothing at all. He's just a normal person to me. See, other people think he's, you know, there's something wrong with him. But in my eyes, there's nothing wrong with Brian. Doug wants to go in the camera, too. Too many people tease Brian now. Too many people do. And I don't like it. So I stick up for him. What can I do? I think a lot of Brian. A lot. I really do. I think a lot of Brian. A peaceful and happy life for Brian. That's all I can ask for. But God will see fit to take care of him. Watch over him. And uh, <clears throat> that he doesn't have any heartaches more than he has now. One day, if he's lucky, Brian may go to a group home for the mentally ill. But there are just five in all of Pennsylvania, with just 45 young people living in them. So it's more likely that when Brian's too old for Eastern, he'll be sent to an adult institution. The hardest part of my day is Sunday when I take him back to school. Knowing that I'm going home to an empty house when Brian should be with me when Brian should be with me. And I have everything in Brian's room as if he's with me every day. When I go past that bed, I can picture Brian in it. When I'm going to bed at night, I can picture Brian in it. And it hurts. And it hurts. That's when I pray for him. You know where you're at now, Brian? Brian, what? Do you know where you're at now? School. That's right. And are you going to be good for Dad? Yeah. That's right. All right, let's go. Brian, 
Moin. Chat, Freunde. Gab wir ein Welches Verkehrs und Zeit? Okay. I love you, Dad. I love you too, honey. I love you a lot. Okay. Good night. Good night, honey. I'm gonna walk my over, Jim. All right, honey. This is the hardest part of the day. Just bring him back here, knowing that I won't see him till next week. There's no Brian in the bed upstairs. I can't tell you anymore. You know this lack of quality. You know this crap. You know just will not be tolerated. You know maybe you know, think about getting a grip on it, man. You know it's your responsibility. You know to clean the bathroom this morning, man. Yeah, you should remember that's time. You know because it's off the wall. You know you should clean out the showers too. You know every one of them uses the shower. You know just being irresponsible. If you want to act like a baby, you get screamed at. If you want to act as more like a mature adolescent, you get talked to. One of the things that we do here is we don't bullshit kids. We don't tell kids that this is some kind of utopia, that everything is going to work out for you, that when you leave here, everything's going to be roses. We don't tell them that out there is a nice place either, because it's not. You know, make sure things get done. So I suggest me the next time you should put my quality on it. The name of the place is Elan. It's a private residential treatment center for out of control teenagers. What you're watching is called a haircut. If you break one of the rules or your attitude isn't right, you get yelled at. Let me tell you something, Martha. What you hear me there? It's unacceptable. Why can't people accept me for me? The teenagers who come here are not mentally ill. Psychiatric hospitals don't work for them. They're alcoholics, drug addicts, and drug pushers. They're teenagers who have victimized others and themselves. I just, you know, I treated myself like scum. I was scum. I sold myself to men who I didn't even know, didn't even care, you know, they didn't care about me. I just wanted what they wanted. And, and it's like a piece of meat, you know, to be blunt. The kids at Elan are almost all white, from upper middle class and wealthy homes. Their parents pay more than $20,000 a year to send them here for treatment. But these are children who have acted out, often violently, against their parents. Mike turned around and gave his mother the finger and said, fuck you. Um, I looked at Mike, and I, I don't recall what I said, but it probably was something like, don't you dare talk to your mother like that. And he turned around and swung at me. You got to think about how you'd feel if you had a 16-year-old kid who is six foot one, who's who's come to the conclusion that he's going to do whatever he wants to do. When I brought Mike here today, I, I just cried. And I knew, and, and the people in school knew that he was coming up here to stay. You know that if he doesn't change, he's going to get arrested. You know that sooner or later, he's going to steal something to get money. The phone rings at 10 o'clock at night, 3 o'clock in the morning. You're shaking. You're wondering, what's this call going to mean? Is it the police? And that's the fear that we live in. We're ready to, to uh, crack. This is an example. Ready to crack. I love him so much. I wouldn't want to lose him. I don't want to lose that camera because I cry all the time. I'm sorry, but I can't help it. Yeah, you're the first one to do it! Yes, sir, day you're in, you're day out, you're life you're at Elan is constant you're confrontation. You're Unrelenting you're pressure. You're I couldn't believe all the shit that was left on those things. Your feelings, your negative attitudes are broken down, dissected, torn apart. The idea is to change your behavior. Elan residents are taught to obey authority. 
They're made to work at menial jobs, to do what they're told to do. Other Elan residents enforce the rules. They record the names, the actions of everyone in every room continuously. At Elan, there is no privacy. Incoming mail is opened. Outgoing mail is read and censored. Telephone calls are monitored. Every conversation is subject to eavesdropping and informing. I want a drink and I want it right now. In therapy, your problems, your hang-ups right are all laid bare. I want a drink and I want it right now. I want a drink and I want it right now. I want a drink and I want it Uh, I was, I just, when I feel like that, it's like there's nothing holding me back. I'm so out of control that I can't stand it. And it's, and it's like, I get really mad, you know? I think, because I know exactly what I'm doing, but I still want it. You know, I don't give, I don't care about anything else but that. Before I came to Elan, about six months before, I had like three suicide attempts in a row. And uh, it was in the back of my mind that, you know, if I drink again and if I go as far as I've gone before, I'm not going to be living anymore. Diane so, comes uh, from a prominent Tucson family. Uh -huh. She was a straight A student and won a scholarship to the University of Arizona. But drinking and drugs became problems she couldn't control. We're talking about attempting suicide by eating 15 pills of antabuse and then going out and having a glass of scotch. We're talking about waking up in the morning and just because you don't have booze, drinking shaving lotion just to get alcohol out of it. Okay, we're talking about going into convulsions and going into seizures and going into blackouts that you almost never came out of. I was at the point where I was pretty wasted one night. And I went out and I got a butcher knife and, you know, started stabbing myself in my stomach, which partly because I wanted my father to, you know, come and say, it's okay, Diana, you know, you're going to be all right. You know, you're a very sick little girl. We'll take you to the hospital and, you know, sew you up. And uh, I just wanted him to know that he loved me because I felt like he didn't. I felt like nobody did. You have to make the decision whether or not it's worth it for you to live. You have got to do it for yourself. And I want you to think about the times that you could never sit somebody down and spill your guts out. And I want you to say, I'm lonely and it hurts me. Hold hands and think about that. I mean, let's get in touch with what you are. When I say no, you drop your hands and you all say no. 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 At Elan, you succeed and survive if you accept the program. If you don't, there are punishments. They're usually called learning experiences. Residents are made to wear signs for days, sometimes weeks, bluntly spelling out their problems and failures. If their behavior is deemed infantile, they're made to wear diapers over their clothes and to carry rattles. If they become hostile or act out, they're put into a ring. There they have to physically fight one Elan resident after another until they're beaten and give in to the group. We weren't permitted to film the ring and a lot more at Elan. We weren't supposed to film the boys you're looking at now. When they refused to participate in the Elan program, they were put in this dumpster filled with garbage. They've been living in it for two weeks. The boy outside the dumpster is guarding them. If they escape, he'll be put inside. Many Alan residents have tried to escape, but they've all failed. When they've managed to get off the grounds, trackers are sent out after them. When they caught this 15-year-old boy, he was put in a rabbit suit and leg shackles. Why did they put you in chains and in a rabbit suit? Because I ran away. When they put them on me, they told me you know, they were going to be on me. Until I left, but, you know, it's been two weeks so far. What does it do? 
Okay, it humiliates him and it restricts his movement. He's run away from here four times. Okay, he's run away from every place he's been before at least 17 or 18 times. I'm not, I won't run away again. I told him that. I told him I won't run away again. But if they were going to put me in jail, you know, you know, they put me in jail. If they wouldn't, you know, they'd have to make me walk around with shackles on. This boy's been in and out of juvenile detention centers for years and faced charges of breaking and entering and assault. For him, it was either Elan or jail. The kid has no idea what prison is like. Somebody has got to introduce to him some realistic concepts of what's ahead of him, and he's going to hit jail if he doesn't change. What's going to happen to him? He's five foot six. He's got bright orange hair and blue eyes. How long is he going to last in jail? You know, I'm not a dog. I'm not, a, I'm not even a person anymore, you know. This is supposed to be America, you know. I still, I still have rights as a human being to walk around. And I can't even do that with these things on. Those things stay on him. He decides how long they stay on him, not me. He makes that decision. If he came up to his director tomorrow and said, I want to get back involved, I want to change, okay? I want to participate. I want to try again. They would come off like that, okay? If he wants to act like a criminal, he'll be treated like a criminal. It's that basic. Now, if that is robbing him of his dignity and robbing him of his freedom, then yes, I'm guilty of it. Elan claims its graduates are now leading happy, productive lives, that they're staying in school, going to college and working, that drug use is way down, and criminal involvement cut by more than half. But parents of some former residents dispute these claims. When Rhode Island parents complained, the state investigated, and found that of 117 former Elan residents from that state, 70 had been arrested, and that one is serving a life sentence for murder in South Carolina. Nevertheless, this year, parents from more than 22 states and eight foreign countries will send 200 of their children to Elan for treatment. You did it anyway. Now you just wanted to, man. Now you don't really care. In the United States today, five million acutely mentally ill children need treatment of a very different kind. Half a million are psychotic, two million schizophrenic, one in five suffers from depression. They need immediate psychiatric help, usually in hospitals. For most Americans, private psychiatric hospitalization isn't possible. The cost for one child can be as much as $120,000 a year. Medical insurance doesn't come close to paying for it. For poor, middle class, even well-to-do families with children in need of long-term care, after savings run out, there's usually just one place left to go. The state hospital. In our country, 20,000 children are admitted to them every year. These young men are autistic. They came to Sagamore Children's Center in New York when they were five or six. Now they're 17, 18, some are 22 years old. Many have lived at this state hospital for more than 14 years. You don't have a pencil, you need to pass it to Joe Romagna teaches autistic children at Sagamore. He's been doing it for the last 12 years. I'll get you. I'll get you. Many of the children in Joe's class get some form of psychotropic medication. The drugs Howard gets control his epileptic seizures, but their side effects can put him to sleep. Let me see, anybody in here? There he is, there he is, all right. Feel any better? Ready to do some schoolwork? Come on, let me give you some work to do. You make me earn my pay, Howard. I can't have you sleeping here. I can't have you sleeping here, that's too easy. That's too easy, Howard. And then you can leave more. Let's see. I have to wake you up. All right, Howie. Let's try this, buddy. Let's try this. All right, we can take sheets. Excuse me, ma'am. Why don't you wash your face? Okay. 
Uh oh, this is gonna hurt. Look out for the shot. Oh, oh. What I hope for for them is that they can be happy and be taken care of uh, all the time. I don't have hope for all of them. They will be like you and me. I don't think that's. I don't think that's possible at this point. You take a kid who's 18, 19 years old, hasn't learned yet to speak, uh, can't write his name yet. Uh, you know, I don't have hope that they're going to be totally normal. I can't say that I always felt that way. When these kids were seven and eight, I used to think so. A specific kid, I would say, yeah, this kid is going to, he'll make it. He'll be, you know, he'll straighten out. He'll be a lot better off than this. But, you know, 12 years later, I see a kid almost the same as he was. You know, he's gotten a little bigger. You know, he shaves now or somebody shaves him, you know. But he's not totally... Uh, He's not a, not a hell of a lot better than he used to be. Autism, as far as researchers know, may be caused by brain damage, organic brain disease, or by genetic factors. One hypothesis is that autistic children inherit a lack of resistance to a virus that destroys part of their brains. A child can be born with autism, or it can take as long as three years to appear. But early on, there's usually a feeling, a recognition that something is not right with your child. Spell Lisa for me. Spell Lisa for me, Lisa. No, put your pencil down a minute. Don't just spell Lisa for me. Don't write it. Spell it. How do you spell Lisa? What letters do you start with? L. Good. Now what's next? I. Uh-huh. Then what? K. No. That's a different word. Look at the wrong word. Spell Lisa for me. L. Good. I. Yes. What's after I? Lisa. L. I. S. Good. What's next? A. Good girl. Very nice. Lisa. Okay. What's the next word we have? So much effort for so little. A lot of people say that. A lot of people say that. Uh, it's not a little to me. It's not a little. It's not a little. Kid, you know, he's a kid. And, uh, you know, he deserves a chance to, to be here like everybody else. He deserves a chance to get better, you know, to enjoy himself. What are you what? doing, Howard? The kids need, need to have somebody close to them. And it's important to me, uh, while I'm doing what I'm doing, that I'm close to the kids, too. Come uh, on. They are, a lot of them, very special to me, the kids. Some, some more than others, the ones I no longer, you know. I feel very close to them. I have no plan to do anything but this for the rest of my life. I mean, I'm certainly comfortable doing this. I, 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 I get a good feeling and I work with these ki kids, and uh, I think I'm doing something for them. And I, I think they appreciate me, you know. What do we send you to school for? To bother you. Oh, you character. Sometimes you can bother me, but sometimes you got to do your work, right? Right? You didn't do any work. In a way, I think they love me. Uh, like I said, uh, they, they can't tell me that, but it's possible. 100,000 children in America have autism. Most of them live a normal lifespan. They grow up, they grow old, but they usually don't get better. And they can get much worse. The boy's name is Billy Calhoun. He was admitted to Sagamore's autistic unit when he was seven. Now he's 20. Billy was transferred to the Sagamore Infirmary after he became self-abusive. He's lived here in restraints for the past two and a half years. For this one, we haven't found an answer yet, and we've been working very hard at it. He's uh, beaten himself in every part of his body. He's thrown himself into the ground, into the floor, uh, torn at his body with his hands. He's rubbed himself against objects to the to raw skin. He's beaten his head to the point of detaching his retina. Not once, but twice. Any way that, that I could think of that he could abuse himself and injure himself, he's done it. Why is this child? Why did God create it? And that's all I've always wondered, you know. What does it mean? It has to have a meaning. Everything has a meaning. What is his meaning? Why is Billy here? I don't know. It's all right, Billy. It's okay, Billy. Three times a day, Billy Calhoun is made to walk so his muscles don't deteriorate. 
The rest of the time he's kept tied up. During those walks, he's watched carefully because of his previous violence towards the staff. Doctors at Sagamore have tried drugs and special diets to try to help him, but so far nothing has worked. Now they're considering more radical treatment, including aversive shock therapy. A device is applied to the body, which produces a, a very intense, painful reaction. I've been told that it's, it's like, it's a type of pain which you don't know. It's not like sticking your hand in a socket. The idea would be to stop his self-destructive behavior using pain as a punishment. And if Billy's condition doesn't improve, Sagamore doctors say they'll reluctantly consider a lobotomy. A lobotomy, to my knowledge, is irreversible and destroys part of the organism. But I suppose that if it came down to the point where there absolutely were no other alternatives, then I can see where that, that could be a consideration if it meant keeping him alive. He's coping, I guess. But don't let it get any worse where he's miserable all the time. If he's not going to get any better, fine. But if he gets sick, as bad sickness, make it a sickness that would take him as opposed to a lingering any more pain. In this business, there's no guarantees of success. We're not God. We're the hospital. We're trying to do the very best we can. What about making him better? I can't do it. I can't do it now. I'd like to find a way. We all would. Many years ago, there was a member of our family that uh, has handicapped children. And she went to church and asked the priest, why me? And uh, she said, the priest said to her, don't you know God looks all over the world to give these problems to, and he never gives them to anyone who can't handle them. That was very satisfying to me. I thought, okay, there's my answer. I didn't ask for this. We never knew that we had handicapping conditions in the family. And they're showing up in this, these generations. And uh, I figured, okay, if that's what you gave me, I guess you figure I can handle it. So it's just the way we've lived it. More than half of the children you've seen in this film will retain their illnesses into adult life, and most of them will be sent to adult institutions. For parents, what looms ahead is frightening. A realization that their children may never get well, that their lives may be spent in institutions. And there are other fears. Fears that come from giving up control of your child's life. And of placing that life in the hands of strangers. In the United States, more than 500 mental patients, including teenagers and children, die each year in hospitals for reasons that are questionable or unexplained. Three of those deaths, all involving young people and all under strikingly similar circumstances, took place at South Beach Psychiatric Center in New York. August 13, 1979, Anthony Ruggieri, a severely depressed young man, was sent to South Beach by his parents. Within 10 days, Anthony Ruggieri was dead. October 10, 1980, 19-year-old Judy Singer arrives at South Beach. She dies six days later. At South Beach, both Judy and Anthony were tied down in straitjackets. Both of them were placed in seclusion rooms. Both were given massive amounts of psychotropic drugs. According to South Beach records, Anthony's order was for more than eight times the maximum daily recommended dose. The doctor who ordered Anthony's medication and who supervised Judy Singer's treatment just before her death was Dr. Jonathan Kane chief of service for the South Beach Intensive Care Unit. On that unit, South Beach patients told us that not only were drugs and straitjackets used to control patients, patients were also made to wear football helmets as a punishment if they talked too much, sometimes for days. 
One South Beach patient who was on the intensive care unit with Judy Singer remembers seeing her tied to a pole just before her death. She let us tape her voice in an isolated part of the hospital grounds on a windy day. She was sitting in a spray jacket tied off to the pole. She was crying for help, for help, for help. And they, they didn't do nothing. She said she had to go to the bed. They wouldn't let her. When she wanted to go to bed, they wouldn't let her go. And she had, she did right there, you know, in her pen. It's terrible. She wanted to get out of the spray jacket. They said, sit still, or, or they're gonna put the, we're going to put the helmet on your head. You know, the football helmet. It's not treatment. It sounds more like torture. To put them in the middle of a room, tie them to a post, and let them defecate on the floor. That's not treatment. I don't care what one's behavioral philosophy is. Clinical medical practice. Dr. Paul Casadante is clinical assistant professor of psychiatry and teaches at the New York University Medical School. What it shows is, as, as I say, at best, a carelessness. What it shows at worst is a perverse inconsideration of all of the good principles of medical practice that we all were taught. She wanted to get out of it. She was, you know, struggling. And, and she, she slided down on the floor, you know, so she started crying. You have to take her out of the straitjacket, I said, before she can't sit there, she's turning blue. But they wouldn't let me. Eleven months after Judy Singer's death on his unit, Dr. Jonathan Kane was reassigned to treat patients in another part of the hospital. Two years after Anthony Ruggieri's death and ten months after Judy Singer's, 17-year-old Andrew Zamora was admitted to South Beach. He was agitated, withdrawn, suspicious. His diagnosis? Acute paranoid disorder. At home, Andrew painted. He kept to himself. He wrote poetry and listened to music. But Andrew had problems connecting with people. He didn't seem to know how to fit in, and he believed people were going to hurt him. Andrew had been to South Beach before, and he was afraid to go back, afraid of the drugs he was given, the spasms they caused in his arms and legs. He was afraid of being put in a straitjacket. But as he became more agitated, his parents reluctantly decided to admit him. For the two days that followed, the Zamoras were not allowed to speak to their son. They were not allowed to visit him. They were told nothing about his treatment. On the third day, August 17th at 5 p.m., Dr. Jonathan Kane, who was the on-call psychiatrist for emergencies that day, went to a phone at South Beach and dialed the Zamora's home number. I received a call from the hospital. They were sending a police car down to me. It was an emergency situation, and I got hysterical. And I said, what sort of emergency situation? And Dr. Kane refused to tell me. He said, I want you to come down to the hospital, and I'll explain it to you then. Uh, we got there, and as soon as I got in, he said, I guess as you expected, Andrew is dead. I said, as I expected, I couldn't believe it. I said, how could my healthy child be dead? I said, you gave him something he shouldn't have received. What did you give him? He says, I don't know. I'll have to look up the medication. According said, to South Beach I records, along with other drugs, Andrew was injected with Thorazine. His mother had warned the South Beach staff he'd been given it before and that its side effects were devastating. But he was injected with it anyway. Following that, he began biting his tongue and moaning. But hospital records show the staff believed he was faking a reaction to the drug and a canvas bed net was thrown over him and tied down to the corners of his bed. I hate this thing that happened to my son, a healthy child, full of life, and the, I bring him, then, him then, then, then two days before, and now he's dead. We asked South Beach for an explanation. Three young people enter the hospital, and within a few days, each of them is dead. But Dr. Lucy Ray Sarkis, director of South Beach, wouldn't answer our questions. The chief of the intensive care unit, Dr. Jonathan Kane, refused to be interviewed. The commissioner of mental health for New York State denied our request to film conditions at the hospital. And Sarah Connell, regional director for New York City, told us, quote, we don't have anything to say about South Beach and we're not going to. But there were people who worked there who did 
want to talk about South Beach. Anybody could die there. Anybody could, could come into an overcrowded, understaffed unit and react so badly that they could die. Anybody. People got medicated to the point that they became zombies. I remember seeing people drooling from the mouth, people uh, unable to control urinary until they got to the bathroom or defecation, totally lost control of those muscles. I just questioned a lot of things going on. I mean, under the name of uh, mental health, I felt the people who were labeled patients were used as experiments. They were like guinea pigs. On August 17th, Andrew Zamora was injected three times with Sorrental, a powerful psychotropic drug. One of Sorrental's side effects is to disrupt the body's ability to cool itself. Andrew was in a room where the air conditioner was turned off. The windows were sealed shut. Andrew was kept tied down as the heat in the heavy canvas bed net became unbearable. Just imagine what it's like that you're sweating, that the heat is building up inside of that canvas bag, that there's very little means of your perspiring other than through your head. Imagine what it's like to be struggling against that. I'm angry. I'm angry because I think my son suffered. And I, it hurts me. I can't stand to think that somebody would treat somebody else like that. A good portion of the time, I see as potential sources of aggravation to me. There's nobody that I'm dealing with that I love. And just to be sure that I don't feel any sort of attachment like that, I just go to the opposite extreme. I still have a hard time seeing the people I'm dealing with as, as people. Andrew had no control over his tremors now, the muscle spasms. His eyes rolled back in his head. And now the staff had second thoughts about him faking a reaction to the drugs. So they gave him more medication to try to control the side effects. By that time, though, drugged and tied down. What had happened to Anthony Ruggieri and Judy Singer before was happening now to Andrew Zamora. And at 4.45 p.m., he was dead. If I said they killed him, would I be wrong? That indicates to me a deliberate attempt on the part of the staff. If I said they let him die, would I be wrong? That you would not be wrong. I tried for eight years putting a report about that place. And I just quit because it fell on deaf ears. No one wanted to hear it. We have had patients hang themselves in a six-foot closet. Two of them. They just walked inside the closet, tied something around their neck, put it on the hook, and just sat down and hung themselves to death. Where was the staff? I hope that God has Andrew with him and at peace. I have this feeling when I was at Mass today, it was such a beautiful Mass, that he was at peace and he was with God. I, I believe that there has to be a better world in this life because I think there's too much suffering and pain in this life. And after we die, there has to be a better world. And I'd like to believe I'd have some peace in my lives if I could believe that Andrew's happy now and is in a better world than he left. The most thing I can love in my life is my son. Very much. And I can even as, as I am suffering now because of him. And I blame him myself for his death. And I love him very much, very much. I can even, I don't have the words to express the love of my, my son. The most important thing in my life today is to communicate with my son. Communicate. And I want him to tell me, Daddy, you're right. You was a nice man. You, you're not guilty of my death. But now when I don't have my son, God, you help me. Help me talk to him. Help me talk to him. And telling him all the wrongs I did to him that I feel sorry. He cannot, he cannot hurt me. When I'm looking at him in the funeral parlor, I talk to him, he cannot talk to me. And now I want you to be between him and me and telling me what he feel about me. In the year and a half since Andrew Zamora died, 
there have been 62 more patient deaths at South Beach. New York State is currently investigating 14 of those deaths, which they consider questionable and unexplained. Dr. Jonathan Kane, Chief of Service of the South Beach Intensive Care Unit, resigned three months after Andrew died. What I think this should serve to show is that without careful clinical supervision, without well-trained people, without people who are interested and concerned with their work, that incidents like this can happen. We need people to take a more active interest in the mental health system and not just the patient advocates who get up there with cardboard posters and protest all treatment uh, and who throw rocks at the gates of the state hospitals, but rather people to take an active interest in staffing the hospitals and improving the quality of care and not just hoping that things will get better because hope will not do it no matter how deep. Are you going to stay alive or are you going to die? That's a tough question to answer because I don't know. Sometimes I feel like killing myself. Other times I'm happy and I want to live forever. Denise ran away from Eastern State Hospital just before her 18th birthday. Neither hospital officials or friends know where she is or what's happened to her. It's time for me to get out of here and make a life for myself, which I plan to do when I leave. Can you do it? Yes, I think I can. I think I can. Jerry did leave Eastern State and is now living by himself in a small Pennsylvania town. So far, he's been unable to find a job, but he's determined to stay out of the hospital and to make it on his own. I'm going to do the huckster for you. Okay. All sound, solid tomatoes, new white potatoes, hard heads, a little fresh cabbage, string beans, bananas, three pounds per quarter. Be right there, lady. Yeah. <laughs> remember Fritz ate your leg off? Yeah, I remember that too. <laughs> Brian McAnally is now 18 years old, old enough to be sent to an adult psychiatric hospital. But recently, he's been accepted by a new group home now under construction in Philadelphia. When Brian moves in, He'll live just four blocks away from his father's home. After 18 months at Elan, Diane graduated in the summer of 1982. Now she works as a secretary and plans to go back to college. But when she's lonely or depressed, she still drinks. Why is this child? Why did God create it? And that's all I've always wondered, you know. Why is Billy here? I don't know. Billy Calhoun has not been given aversive shock therapy or a lobotomy. Although he still lives in the Sagamore Infirmary, now he's out of restraints 13 hours a day. For the past year, the Sagamore staff has worked intensely with Billy, rewarding him with praise and affection for not hurting himself. And his self-abusive behavior is almost gone. Billy's improved so much that now he's able to attend a special school with other children. Those are the screams of a 17-year-old girl, a troubled youngster crying for help. They're asking you, how does it feel? This is called confrontation therapy. It comes in various forms. It is supposed to help troubled children. And you're running alive and standing up there, trying to make people feel sorry for you, and running a game to the top, and you better start answering questions. Because with you, it's going to be one minute more. Give me one more minute, just a second, maybe tomorrow. It's now, Elaine. It starts now. Now you know you never tested yourself. 
I did it you I will never, time. ever. I did it when I was there last time. Yeah, but for a couple of days, you've never tested That's it. All along you've never tested it. There's your father right there turned around and told you he's going to take control of it. And that's exactly what you want, but then you won't look at him over. A few years ago, these teenagers might have been put away in juvenile prisons or traditional psychiatric wards. Today, they are the raw material of a growing industry, an industry that treats troubled kids. That word troubled is a relatively new label for kids like these. It used to be that we had bad kids who were locked away in reform schools and sick kids who were locked away in mental hospitals. But in the past decade, we've been seeking an alternative. Instead of simply punishing unacceptable behavior, we've been looking for ways to change that behavior. This facility called Elan claims to be able to do that. Elan is a leader in an expanding coast-to-coast -coast industry, parts of which we'll look at tonight. The growth of that industry has been spurred by the availability of government money to pay for an alternative treatment. But there is another, more basic reason. This country is producing millions of youngsters who are in trouble with society, with school, with their families, with themselves. NBC News is grateful to the parents and children who are included in this report. They agreed to participate in order to help others understand this national problem. The children in this report are not retarded and they are not insane, but their range of problems is enormous. Crime, sex, drugs, emotional disturbances, truancy. The main thing that they have in common is that somebody, their family, a judge, a social worker, has sent them away for help, sent them away for the child's own good to places that often call themselves residential treatment facilities or group homes or therapeutic communities, or private schools, or boys or girls ranches. Today, there are over 3,000 such facilities, both profit-making and non-profit, and they have custody of an estimated 300,000 American youngsters. The treatment which some of these children undergo is a matter of controversy, partly because there are no national standards to determine where therapy ends and mistreatment begins partly because solid evidence as to which treatments work best is hard to come by. Don't you stare at me. Portions of what you are about to see are raw and emotional. And you may be shocked at what can be done to a youngster for the child's own good. NBC News presents For the Child's Own Good. Reported by Robert Rogers. Deep in the woods of Maine is one of the most innovative and most profitable adolescent treatment centers. This is Elan. You are watching primal scream therapy, which is intended to release a youngster's deepest fears and emotions. But Elan also uses older techniques, like physical punishment for misbehavior and dunce caps for scholastic failure. The kids here are not called patients or inmates, but residents. They come from all over the country. Many have been in other psychiatric institutions before Elan. Their behavior problems range from serious crime to truancy, from sexual promiscuity to drinking and drug taking, from chronic disobedience to running away from home. Some are ordered here by juvenile courts or state agencies, but many are sent by their own parents. Few youngsters volunteer for Elan. Some told us they were whisked out of their homes in what they call the Elan Snatch. Some of the kids have mentioned that they or their peers were snatched. What does that mean? <laughs> well, it's usually in the morning, you see, uh, when four residents, um, generally big people, you know, uh, or taller and heavier, uh, will show up at, a, uh, at someone's house and... Um, go into a new resident's bedroom and say, hi, Johnny, we're from Elon, and we'd like you to come with us. Why, hell, I will. Oh, yes, we've we're been through it, and it's a good thing, and they, and they talk very nicely, but they're big, and they're strong, and they're insistent, 
and there are four of them, and so it happens. No matter how they arrive, the average resident will spend 17 months here. Whether they like it or not, they become part of a rigid hierarchy. Conformity brings promotion and eventual graduation. Misconduct or failure to adapt enthusiastically to the system brings punishment and public humiliation. Get out there. Come in. You know, I fell for the fight, man. You know, but you're taking advantage. You know, because there's no strength in here, okay, to apply any kind of pressure on you. In the jargon of Elan, this is a haircut. Variations of this shouted reprimand echo through every Elan residence. The haircut is a mainstay of the system. The louder, the better. You make sure that everybody else has to be born too. You don't need to give them a seminar. You don't need to put everyone to sleep. Okay, Even the most minor infraction provokes a torrent of castigation and insults from staff members or from any resident who happens to rank higher in the Elan pecking order. You see, out there, no one's gonna accept that out of you. You see, you better get a grip on it. You know, I could ask myself, you know, I ain't gonna produce it. The theory is that blowing the most trivial incidents out of proportion with angry shouting will lead the supposed offender to take a closer look at himself. Those in charge are convinced you know, that it works. You can feel you can just lay back in the cut and accept everything that goes around here. Their facility is running. The man who runs Elan is Joe Ritchie. Himself a former delinquent and heroin addict, Ritchie has strong opinions on why so many families no longer seem able to control their own children. They're acting out. Uh, you know, we've gone through some serious craziness regarding adolescents in the last two decades. We've gone through the free school concept of it's not important that a child has structure. Let him write on the walls. You know, let him do this, let him do that. Let him express himself. Well, that's nonsense. Everybody knows that successful people are people who are disciplined. Even in an expanding business like childcare, Elan's growth has been spectacular. It was founded just nine years ago by Joe Ritchie and Dr. Gerald Davidson, a Boston psychiatrist. They began with just four children. Today, there are over 300 residents. Profits from Elan have helped make Joe Ritchie a millionaire. At Elan, youngsters perform most of the daily chores. Each household is a tightly structured community. New residents do the dirty work under the supervision of more senior residents with titles like ramrod, expediter, and department head. Throughout their stay, residents are switched from job to job and promoted or demoted depending on their conduct and attitude. It is all part of the Elan therapy. They represent our state. At night, words, the residents go to school. Unlike some for treatment for centers, state, Elan right? stresses education. House representatives represent there are 27 full-time teachers and an accredited high school, as well as remedial classes for those who need them. All right, the executive branch. Dunce caps are required attire for those who fail courses. Is making. In the households, discipline is maintained by an elite group called the expediters. They relay orders, keep track of every resident, and report negative behavior. Some call them spies. Joe Ritchie prefers another name. The expediter is a policeman, very much like the policemen out in society. Uh, they play the same role. They're the line of defense between the normal people and the lunatics. Uh, what, what an expediter does in a house is he makes sure that the game is played honestly. For instance, an expediter's job is to make sure that if you're supposed to be in your department and you're functioning, because that's what it calls for, that you're not walking around the halls or you're not hanging out in your room. Even if a youngster manages to elude the expediters and run away, he can look forward to being tracked down and brought back. Joe Ritchie believes that much of Elan's success can be traced to the residents' knowledge that they cannot escape. Adolescents are very shrewd. If you go into a hospital and you don't want to stay there, all you have to do is make an aggressive gesture at a nurse and you're kicked out. Or all you have to do is light your bed on fire and you're kicked out. So consequently, kids learn how to get out of treatment. At Elan, the first thing they learn is you're not going to get out of here. If you burn the place down, we'll sleep in a tent together. 
uh, you know, no matter how many times you run away, we will go and get you. Why? Because we have a commitment, all right, to you and to ourselves. You know what? I'm sick and tired of your garbage around here. You know what? I got to deal with your skank. I know that. This, too, is part of the treatment. In so-called encounter groups, residents are encouraged to express their hostile feelings. The result is usually a stream of curses and obscenities. Despite the words, the shouting is so mechanical, so repetitious, that to an outsider, at least, it is not so much shocking as it is monotonous. I can't feel feminine. I mean, I can't walk around and, and try to be feminine because I, I end up turning it into gamey because of my other feelings. Try to walk around here feminine and high heels and everything I try. After the shouting, there is an attempt to resolve hostilities. Yes, so why don't you ask for help? Why don't you sit down with her and say, Paul... The discussion is led by a staff member. Like most of the therapeutic staff, his main qualification is that he is himself a graduate of Elan. There are no national standards, nor even a consensus of expert opinion on how much formal training should be required of persons involved in treating troubled kids. But both Dr. Davidson, a trained psychiatrist, and Joe Ritchie, who did not graduate from college, believe that experience is the best teacher when it comes to helping the type of kids who come to Elan. What does that mean if you ask for help? What does that mean to you? They might say, no, get away. Or they might, you know, because I know the things I do, and they might do the same thing to me. It costs $17,400 to send the average youngster to Elan for one year. Even at that price, there are judges, social workers, and parents who consider it a bargain. Elan's defenders claim it has the most consistently effective program for salvaging young people who are too difficult for other facilities to handle. So many states want to use Elan that there's a waiting list. But on the other hand, one state agency in Massachusetts will no longer send their youngsters here because they object to the way the children are treated. One reason is the use of physical punishment. Joe, you make no bones about it. There is corporal punishment here at Elan. Tell us about it. What are the stages it comes in? Who's it administered by? Well, it's, it's administered by the kids, first of all. And corporal, it's a, it's a harsh term, okay? What it is, is we have the ring, okay, which uh, everybody misinterprets. It's, it's not a boxing ring. It's a ring of human people. Youngsters who are accused of being bullies are forced to fight continuously against a series of opponents until they are beaten. The bully is introduced as what he is. In this corner is the bully who's trying to turn this facility into a detention center, okay? And in this corner is the house champion who's going to show him why it can't be done. And that's exactly how it does. And we never allow the bully to win. But uh, girls get put in the ring, too. Well, girls bully as well as boys, though. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're a uh, equal rights facility. Uh, we also use spanking, which is symbolic. Again, it's a last resort. Okay, and it's, and it's one resident spanking another resident, and it's done with a ping pong paddle. Okay, and uh, usually a person won't get spanked more than once or twice. But it's a symbolic thing, which is if you're going to act like a baby, you should be treated like a baby. Well, when they spanked me, I mean, they didn't have to spank me, so I turned black and blue. Simple as that. I mean, that was just one time after another. I was so sore I couldn't sit down. Now, to me, that's a little ridiculous. How often were you spanked? every day for a long time. Hard. Oh yeah, clipboards, um, hands, <laughs> anything, you know, something that they could, well, I would feel it supposedly. They thought it would, I needed it because I supposedly was a terribly big baby. How many people spank you? Well, it depends. Usually when they use a paddle, they may have four or five people spank a person like three to five times each. You know, and it doesn't feel too good. So. Do you have any trouble sitting down the rest of the week? Oh, yeah. I have had trouble doing that for a Well, what I was saying was that we're upfront about it, the boxing ring, the spanking, that we're into containment, controlling, and justice. We're not into degradation. Uh, the idea is not to punish, all right? The idea 
is to make sure we have an orderly society, a society where people don't get abused. In my early days at Elan, I uh, split. I left the program and I went to Boston. I stayed in Boston approximately two days and I returned to the program where I uh, encountered a semi-professional boxer in what they call the boxing ring. Um, it was more than just the boxing ring. It was uh, sort of, you could say, a kill situation where I stood no chance even in defending myself. And uh, it was too much. It was definitely too much. You were badly beaten? Yes. Mm -hmm. Why is it so much fun for you to be miserable? And what do you get out of it? In the Alan system of relentless emotional pressure, the ultimate tool is the general meeting. Prompted by staff members, the entire household confronts a single resident. The purpose is to force her to reveal her deepest feelings about herself. You just better start being honest with us, man, because everyone here is getting pretty hostile. I, just, I get hostile, so I look at you as an ingrate. Right, I look at you as a brat, I look at you as a spoiled brat. You have nothing in the, you know, inside you, just a selfish little spoiled leech is what you are. If you think people you know, are gonna, you know, you know, give you and get you in this, you're, you're out of your mind, you know what I mean? You just... The girl is 16, from the Middle West. Her parents sent her here after she had run away from home and got in trouble with the law. That's why I'm reacting to you. You're disgusting in a way, man. Because everyone here is trying to be the exact opposite of what you are now, and you want to hold on to it. That's the disgusting part of it. You just think that you, you are it, okay? And as long as the girl resists making the admissions which the staff wants to hear, the angry mood intensifies. Okay, and what I want to ask myself is why do they have to sit down, and why do they have to go through it, and why do they have to be honest, and you don't have to? Answer me that one. Why do they have to do it? And you don't. I should do it, but I don't. No, I don't. Why don't you I think you it. have to? I can be honest with you, I just don't tell the whole thing. I just Why? Well, you tell the whole thing. You're not honest. You're not honest. You haven't been honest since the day you walked in the door. Yes, I am the right now. Yeah, you better start being honest around here. You just know we're around here. Yes, you Finally, the meeting erupts into a tirade of foul language. Residents take turns verbally bludgeoning the girl with obscene insults and threats until she is reduced to tears and submission. You little selfish little ingrate chill. You know, I feel like you come up there ripping your face off. You don't think I'm gonna sit back here. You know, everybody's gonna feel sorry for you. Well, the world don't, you know, revolve around you. Everybody went around and 99 and 9 tenths percent of the people in this room told you in so many words they think you suck as a person. That you give nothing and that if they had their way, they'd cut your of having to deal with an ingrate like you. And then you stand up there as if nobody said it, as if they believe everything you're trying to run on. What kind of response do you expect to get? You're dishonest, you're lying, you're playing your games. If you want to change so bad, why is it that you don't tell the truth? What do you feel that, that you've done a, that's, that makes you such a bad I person? I hate myself first because I, like when I, like when I was out there, I, uh, I just, I tell my mother I hate her 24 hours a day. <laughs> I, I, she was a bitch and I hated her so much because she didn't give me what I wanted. To, she didn't give me what I wanted. And I just, I can remember telling her to say, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And I'm just, yeah, what else? And, 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 and I know you don't want to address yourself to it. I'm saying that, uh, well, why don't you really hurt you? You make yourself feel like it's such a dirt road. Hey, abortion? Well, what about that? Hmm? I hate myself. <laughs> Just because I hate <laughs> That's not what you told me before. Well, what, what's so hard to, 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 to get it up right now, Sam? Why can't you put your I don't. I don't like to think about it. And when well, I think, think about it, okay, because they don't like to think about things either. But they have to. And what is it? I look at myself as a dirty, sleazy, scummy person that used to live on the streets. Even though I didn't come from the streets, 
But I just, I picture myself doing it, you know, just going out on the streets and just going to bed with every gay I know. See, why do you keep passing over? It's not what you told me, it's not what you told other people. You know, be real. I hate myself for it. I hate myself for going through that. I'm having a... What does it make you feel like? Like I'm not even a... Exist. I just come right off the, off the streets and I hate it. And I just hate myself so much. What does, what does an abortion mean to you? What does that mean? I killed something. It was a part of me that I wanted. To, I wanted so much, but I wanted like someone to love and someone to love me back, and I just flushed it right down the toilet. That makes me feel like. So dirty, like disgusting. NBC News queried a number of mental health experts about the effectiveness and safety of this type of confrontation. Most replied that it all depends on a variety of factors. One has to be extremely careful in using confrontation. You can only use confrontation when there is also support, when there is also follow through, when there is also some kind of alternative that the youth can uh, learn positively, positive ways of dealing with situations. Negative things in which the person is just destroyed as a human being, humiliated, devastated, ruined, and thrown into a, a terribly, terribly destructive state can lead in some cases to psychosis. The only reason that we can make the kinds of demands we do and put the kinds of pressure on young people is because we give them an equivalent amount of support. And so if you, if you spend time here, at first all you hear is the loud noise and the demands and so on and so forth. But if you spend time and you watch, you begin to see the tenderness and the support and the caring and the organized caring that goes on in this place. The last four days, we've seen you go through some pretty rough stuff. Many changes. Well, do you think this meeting we saw today, all these kids calling you names and putting you down, do you think that's helped you? Yeah. And it, yes, it has, because I need, I need it. I need to hear what, how people look at me so I can change. Because I know they, they may look at me a, a certain way, or a slut, or a sleaze, or a dirt bag, or whatever. And I need to hear it because I, it makes me want to change. It makes me not like it. I don't like hearing it at all. And as much as I hate it, it's good for me just so I could change it and, and feel good about myself, because right at this point, I hate myself. This young man, named Steve, spent 18 months at Elan. Two years after leaving there, he is a full-time college student. He earns spending money playing with a rock group and has become a dedicated athlete. Elan likes to call itself a last resort facility for troubled kids who have not been helped by other, more traditional methods. It claims that two-thirds of all its former residents are now leading productive lives. That figure has not been scientifically verified, but Steve considers himself an Elan success. I like to think of myself as being a successful graduate, yeah. What about other graduates that you know? I can only judge it against mine, and I think they're doing well, some better, some not so good, but they're all doing as best they can, and a heck of a lot better than before. I look back at Elan and I figure, uh, where, where was I? No, really, where was I? Where, what were these people doing to me? They were saying they were helping me, but uh, now that I'm back home, I'm not sure where I am. Compared to the other Elan graduates that you know personally, are you doing better or are you doing worse than the average? I'm doing worse than the average, yes. Um, In what ways? I don't have a job. I'm supported by my parents. What's life like now? I've never been happier. I haven't been happier in my uh, 19 years. You still doing drugs? Occasionally I smoke pot once in a while and some other things, but uh, not as much anymore as I ever did. But it's not running your life? Oh, no, not at all. My work is running my life. I enjoy my work so much now. I used to hate to work before. I actually like it, and to me that's surprising. But you still think that you might be dead today? 
or at least be a an addict and maybe a hooker if if you hadn't gone to a line. I believe that. Yeah, it could be true. That is a very big possibility. Also, I could have turned the whole tables around myself, like I was saying. One or the other, and I don't want to go back five years and find out. It's the best we got. I'm serious. It's, it's the best that we have. I mean, there are other institutions that, you know, maybe a little bit better. There may be a little bit more staff, but I've worked in enough institutions to know that this is, you know, it's the best system we got and nobody's come up with a better system yet. In this business, there's no guarantees of success. We're not God. We're the hospital. We're trying to do the very best we can. What I hope for for them is that they can be happy and be taken care of uh, all the time. I don't have hope for all of them. They will be like you and me. I don't think that's, I don't think that's possible at this point. You take a kid who's 18, 19 years old, hasn't learned yet to speak, uh, can't write his name yet. Uh, you know, I don't I have hope that they're going to be totally normal. I have no plans to do anything but this for the rest of my life. I mean, I'm certainly comfortable doing this. I, 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 I get a good feeling I work with these ki kids and, uh, I think I'm doing something for them, and I, I think they appreciate me, you know.
Buck five, 201. Oh my God. Dude, get the fuck over here now. Yo. Shit. <laughs> Gotta do the typical. Oh, that's beautiful. It's like actually real? Oh, it is. Dude, there's my vape juice. Oh, what the fuck? <laughs> Dude, someone had a uh, interesting time. Oh, this is what the stuff is. Dude, what the stuff? Oh, it's still wet, dude. Blue liquid. <laughs> It's oh, blue liquid. Oh, it's just food coloring. Oh, dude. Oh, yeah, they sure did. I mean, okay, I guess. So that's what they found. This is where they put all this fucking blue liquid in. That's a real serious guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not fucking around. Oh, dude, this must be like the yeah, principal's dude. office or some shit. Straight up permeable layer. Oh, those people finally left my car. Or they thank you. Yeah. Or they just towed it. That would suck. Part of the, part of the exhibit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we could easily pop out this one, though. We hopping out here? Are we? We go. We go. Yeah, let's go to these other buildings. Oh, oh dude, this is like killing my ass. We gotta go until I got Nah. Yeah. Nah, fuck the laces. Dude. <laughs> Athletic laces. They keep closing it. Idiots. Dude, it's like fucking five feet. <laughs> there's, a, there's a window wide open over here. Oh, they went a nice easy way. Oh, there's even more buildings in the woods down there. Yeah. Over here? Oh. My dumb ass didn't even see it.
Oh, dude, I am definitely gonna get my next cut. Yeah, someone really had a good time with food coloring. <laughs> oh, dude, we got classrooms in here. Is there a science room in here? Oh, well, both people have had some time, had some fun here. This place has bad vibes, burn it down. Okay. Put at. Put the only functional one. 